and, and looking back now, it's like, of course, I got all my ministry training there. Everything I do with the organization is because I sat under my wonderful pastor who taught me the, the hard knocks of life of what it's like to be a Christian. And if you want to be effective, you got to go through some things. And you got to learn things. So about, I find, Sophie, I, we finally got DVR. I watched American Idol. And I said, honey, I got to go on American Idol. So this is before she died, obviously. And I... I just got excited. I told my pastor, I said, hey, man, I'm going to American Idol. He's like, okay, I give him my blessing. He said, I know you'll do good on it. And I said, thank you. <laughs> and I, I just went and um, we made up my mind. And Sophie, I said, I'm going to try. She's like, finally, dummy, I've told you to go try out. Now, 28, get this, 28 was the cutoff age. You cannot try out after 28. She died one month. I was 28 and she died one month before my audition. She passed away July 9th, 2008. My audition was August 8th, 2008. Do you think I wanted to go? Absolutely not. Did not want to go try out because, you know what, I was so broken, I was so mad, I was so angry, I didn't know what to do. And I, I still had my faith, I was like, God, you're going to turn this around. But I finally came to a point, I said, God, maybe if I put this in your hands, you can turn this around. This is what's so key about the sermon, he said, get up. You got to move. Because I got to a place in my life where I, I didn't want to get out of bed. I was just like, I remember just one morning I woke up and I, I literally felt a shift in the atmosphere. I don't know how to explain it, but I felt an attack. And it drove me crazy. I didn't know what to do. I just felt hopeless. And I went and tried out for American Idol. Um, and I'll kind of brief this up now because I'm going long. But as I tried out for the show, you see, um, you see I got the third place on the show. And I got to listen to this. I got to share my story. There's, a, there's an average audience of about 25 to 30 million a night when they watch. And I was able to share my story with who knows, over hundreds of millions of people. The, store, the, the show was aired in 60 countries. I had people hitting my, 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 my social network saying, man, I was going to give up. I was going to, people told me I was going to kill myself tonight. One lady specifically said I was going to kill myself. I had my knife in my hand and a bottle of pills. And she said I was in the kitchen. Then I heard this voice on the TV. She said she went into the kitchen and she heard my story. She started to break down crying because she was like, man, if he can go through this, I can go through this. So people, so that's the first part of the story. I believe this. God knew he could trust me with this. It's not that he wanted me to go through it, but he knew he could trust me with this because he knew the outcome of this. So not only did American Idol have all this effect, you know, American Idol was hope for me. American Idol was this thing that all of a sudden gave me a reason to live again because I had no dream. I'm going to tell you the power of a dream, and this is what Sophia's heart is built on. The power of a dream is simply this. If you don't have a dream, usually most people who don't dream, they have no reason to live. They really, and I didn't have a dream at this time. Nothing, I didn't want to live. But when I had the inkling of American Idol, all of a sudden a dream came alive in my heart. And I was like, oh my gosh. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, I've always wanted a music career. Maybe, just maybe, this is it. And I took it. And all of a sudden, all this hope, I got the whole world looking at me. I got people telling me about how much, you know, they love me at this point. It was amazing. Now let me tell you the second part of the story. So that's the first amazing part of the story. The second part of the story is a story that's still being written. And I think this is going to be the greatest story. By the time I go to heaven, this will be the greatest story. This will be the greatest thing you know about Danny Goki. And this is it. When she passed away, we had just switched. A few months before she passed away, we had switched from, from my insurance benefits to her insurance benefits. Because it would be cheaper through her, through her job. Well, we did that. But when she passed away, her principal called me and said, listen, I don't know if you know this, but with her life, with her insurance, there's a, there's a death stipend that automatically comes with it. And he said it was an X amount of dollars. And I remember I was offended when he told me that because I was like, how dare you put a price on, my, um, on Sophia? But I didn't, I didn't think that. I mean, I thought that, but I didn't say it. And so finally he gave this to me and I said, I just had this knowing like, this can't be the end. I can't say goodbye. This can't be the end. And that's when I formed the organization. I took that money and I formed the organization. And this is key because you, you won't know why things happen in your life. But as God writes a story, he's going to st start, certain things are going to start manifesting. And it's just going to happen. Listen, I'm not anybody special by any means. It's just that God had a plan for my life and I decided to surrender to it. And now he's fulfilling the plan of my life. You know why? Because he wants me to be hope for someone else. And so I take this money, I form the organization, after the show's over, I get off, and people are asking, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. What are you going to do? I don't know. Anyways, and it's cool. I, you leave it in God's hands. What we started doing, we knew, well, hey, what do I like? I like music and arts. Most of the things that God wants you to do is already planted in your heart because it's how you're created. I sing. So one of the things we did is, like, let's do music and arts programs for children. Sophie loved children. Let's do that. So that's the first thing we did. So we formed the kids' choir and dance team in Nashville. We just, I mean, in Milwaukee. We just landed our first location in Milwaukee this past year. We have their own place now in Milwaukee. That's really cool. It's a big step for us. So then we, the kids are on the road with me. They're traveling with me. They're seeing my tour bus. 
and then now um, Nashville floodheads. Oh yeah, here's the kids' car. Aren't they beautiful? These kids. Society likes to x these people out. You should see them. They're doing hip hop ballet. Amazing singers. I'm getting ready to shoot a music video with them next month. We're gonna take. We're gonna start the movement. I call my music a movement. I'm gonna start using my social networks. I'm gonna start. We're gonna record a music video. I'm gonna be singing. The kids are gonna be singing, and they're gonna be doing their their stuff. They're so good. Anyways, we're in Nashville. We're getting ready to set the, the choir in Nashville, where I live now. And I ended up moving to Nashville. If I would have won the show, I took third place. If I would have won the show, I would have had to move to New York or L.A. But since I didn't win the show and took third place, I ended up getting signed by a record company in Nashville, Sony. And because, and this is where the, the testimony really begins here. Because So I get signed there, and um, we start figuring out, what are we going to do with Sophia's Heart? I'm making my album. What are we going to do with Sophia's Heart? The, we get ready to launch the kids' choir, the flood hits. Did you guys hear about the Nashville flood that happened in 2010? Almost $2 billion worth of damage. My, 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 my executive director at the time was like, listen, we need to do something. I said, his name is Shing. I said, Shing, we don't have any money to do anything. We're a struggling organization. He said, Danny, mark my words, we need to do something. And I was like, okay, Shing, do what's in your heart. So he came up with this idea. We wrote, we wrote Best Buy in Nashville. And we asked if we could use a vacant facility, 44,000 square feet. Long story short, they gave us a facility, um, 44,000 square feet. We get 13,000 items donated. We help 450 families representing 1,500 people. There's a homeless community. We're starting to help them. Over this four-month uh, time period, the mayor comes. He honors us. He gives us a certificate. We're one of the longest standing relief centers in Nashville out of nothing. Out of nothing. Out of no finances. And then from that point, from that point, Best Buy said, well, we need our... We, they let us use their facility for one dollar for four months and they paid all the electricity everything on it and they said they need their facility back so i'm like oh man god we got a lot of pallets here stuff what do we do and and we started meeting with pastors like how can we team up how can we team up to start helping and then every door shuts every door shuts to the point of frustration our last meeting with one pastor who promised us space and we said we'll alleviate the poor you know the needs of the poor by supplying them if you give us space all of a sudden that door shut and then we get a call on our answer machine that day. A guy says, listen, I have a 77,000 square foot facility in East Nashville. Um, I'm wondering if you're interested in it. I call him back right away. We take a tour that day and it's unbelievable. It's like you walk through this place and you're like, are you kidding me? There's 45 rooms. There's, each room has its own bathroom. And right now in Nashville, there's only one homeless family facility. They have five rooms and a shared bathroom. We have this opportunity now we have 45 rooms, each with their individual Restroom. There's 4,000 homeless people in Nashville. 2,200 are homeless kids. Can you believe that? Oh, more than half. And so we get in there. The, the, the realtor comes in. He's like, all right, now I know this guy said he wants to do it free. But what he meant is he wants to give it to you for, you know, a half donation, half price. And I'm like, I, I just let him talk. And I go to my team. I said, listen, if this is God, he'll give it to us because we ain't got a dime in the bank. Anyway.